Hello, uh, my name is Bob Barker, and welcome to today's uh, GC Advantage program. Um, the topic of today's session is turning lawyers into leaders and developing successors. Um, the session is, is part of our professional development program. It's complimentary um, and hope you are all enjoying it. Um, if this is your first one, uh, please uh, you know, take a look at the other ones that we do have. Uh, we schedule them on a monthly basis. Um, uh, next month, the topic is data analytics and KPIs. Uh, oh, oh my, how to recognize and use metrics to reduce costs and, and add value. Um, and the, the month after that, it's managing through uh, crushing litigation and disruptive M&A. And uh, the um, topic for April is going to be um, preparing for your first year as a general counsel. Um, in today's session, we'll learn about the qualities of successful leaders and uh, information about general counsel succession and how executive coaching can be an effective tool to help improve leadership and prepare for succession. Uh, we also have a library of on-demand um, webinars uh, of previous GC Advantage programs. Um, and you can find all this information at uh, Barker Gilmore slash GC Advantage. Um, today's presentation is being recorded and it will be added to the library in roughly three weeks. Um, and an email will be sent to all of those of you who've registered um, once that material is up on our website. Um, we will have a question and answer session today. Uh, so during the webinar, feel free to submit your questions. Um, there's a, um, down in the um, Zoom application, you'll see a Q&A icon and you can submit your questions there. Um, you'll be able to also see questions that have been submitted by others and if it's a, a similar question, you really like the, the question, you can um, click on a thumbs up. And what that'll do is that'll raise uh, that question uh, to the top of the queue so that the panelists uh, know that this is a, a topic that's of, of great interest to many of you. Um, we'll do our best to answer uh, the questions um, throughout the course of the meeting, as well as, as at the end. Um, and uh, if you have any technical problems, uh, with uh, you know the, the application or anything today, um, feel free to, to click on the chat feature and that is to communicate to our support staff. Um, so I'm uh, pleased to, uh, to introduce uh, the two uh, panelists today. Um, we have Marla Persky as one of the uh, uh, our senior advisors as well as AB Cruz, um, uh, one of our advisors as well. And so Marla, I'll turn this over to you. Thanks. I'll just do a quick introduction of myself. Welcome everybody. Thank you, Bob. Uh, my name is Marla Persky. I've been a senior advisor with Barker Gilmer for, I think it's going on three years now. And I particularly work with general counsel who are in some sort of career transition. My background is, is that I've been general counsel of two of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, Baxter International and Beringer Ingelheim. Uh, and I also spend my time being a direct, an independent director on a variety of corporate boards. What I coach people on as an executive advisor is really leadership transition, how to take advantage of your skill set and build your career and help others build their careers as well. AB, you want to give yourself a little bit of a background? Sure, I'll be quick and uh, relevant to our discussion today. Well, first of all, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Marla, and welcome, everyone. Um, I've been had the good fortune of being a general counsel uh, CLO uh, like Marla uh, for multiple companies, uh, both public and private, across uh, various industries, media and entertainment, biotech, pharma, and financial services. Um, some of the things we've talked about, we'll talk about today, you know, those leadership moments, uh, learning moments uh, came from those GC roles. But a number of them also came from the fact that uh, I spent some time in the military. In fact, I'd spent 33 plus years in the military and uh, a few years back retired as a, a rear admiral. Um, so many of those leadership development moments uh, came during uh, that experience in particular. 
And I look forward to sharing some of those uh, thoughts and lessons learned uh, during today's presentation. Thank you. Great. So uh, I'd like to go to the slides, please. Uh, you're not going to have to stare at us the whole time, everybody. That's the good news for today. So um, law school teaches us to think like lawyers. And law firms help us gain experience in designated areas of law and how to service clients. But where do lawyers learn the essential elements of leadership? Because to be a truly successful general counsel, you need to lead people, projects, and teams. A.B., how, how have you learned in your career how, well, you're, you're a unique individual because you had the opportunity to learn in a military standpoint, but for the teams that you've led inside your companies as general counsel, what do you do to help develop leaders? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Uh, and you're exactly right, Marla. Uh, you know, such important things as leadership development, even how to run a business. That's not something you get from law schools as you, as you mentioned. Um, and, um, you know, really evolving from a tactical operator or individual contributor, which, you know, most of us lawyers started out as to, and shifting or moving or transitioning to being that strategic visionary uh, leader is truly an evolution. And um, as such, it takes, you need to be intentional. You need to have goals in that regard. You need to be thoughtful in that regard. You need to work with others to develop those leadership skills. Um, part of it, um, and we'll get more into it, is understanding the whole concept of um, group dynamics and team building and so forth. Again, moving from individual contributor, somebody who's a subject matter expert in whatever area, it could be IP, what, it, what have you, and then bringing on additional skills through formal training, as well as observing, uh, watching other leaders that you encounter either within your organizations or, uh, or beyond your organizations and learning from them, both good leaders and bad leaders. And, uh, and over time, uh, building up your acumen as a, as a leader and uh, being prepared to take on leadership positions. So as the next slide, we'll, we'll ex start a discussion on there are qualities of successful leaders and we can learn from one another, as A.B. mentioned, watching other people, borrowing what you see as good things that they do and maybe avoiding some of the things that you see that are less productive. But what's going to be important is taking what you have learned taking what you've observed and really developing your own style to lead authentically. There are commonalities among successful leaders. The next slide is from research that was conducted by Harvard Business School and was published in the Harvard Business Review in 2014. And it's the CEOs themselves identifying what they think are the key skill sets necessary for good, successful leaders. A.B., do you agree with this listing? Uh, yes, certainly, uh, you know, to the extent that, or recognizing it's coming from CEOs, it, it, it certainly, uh, for the most part, uh, falls in line, especially the early ones. I actually like the, the, the first couple of them, inspires and motivates others and displays high integrity and honesty. I think those are uh, key qualities, certainly that you, a CEO or anybody would wanna see in, um, in uh, a member of their leadership team. I have to say that one thing that catches my eyes that we'll talk about a little bit more is, I'm surprised it fell down the list of it, and that is develop others. Um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, the more senior you get, the less it's about you and the more it's about those under your care, uh, you know, who are depending on you as a leader and your leadership skills to guide them uh, on their professional journeys and, uh, and career advancement and uh, career fulfillment. And I've always said there's no, no better way to cement your legacy as a leader 
than to really develop and nurture uh, those that want to and aspire to be you or to, uh, that are following in your way. So I'm a little, you know, a little bit surprised that develop uh, others uh, is fell that far down the list. But again, this is from the CEO perspective, so understandable. Right. And as we well know, most companies get their next CEO from outside their organization. So I don't know if it's the CEO ego or what, but it's hard to develop your successor. My top three on this list happens to be the inspiring and motivating others, communicating clearly, consistently, and authentically, and driving for results. Because you won't be a leader very long if you cannot deliver results. But this listing, as AB alluded to, doesn't tell the full story. Uh, the next slide talks about qualities of a leadership, because there's skill sets, but then there's also qualities. AB, you want to take this one? Yeah, I will. Um, you're exactly right. You know, often left uh, off the list are softer, uh, more personal qualities, but they are also essential, absolutely critical. Although a certain degree of analytical and technical skill is a minimum requirement for success, uh, studies indicate that emotional intelligence may be the key attribute that distinguishes outstanding leaders from those who are just adequate. Without it, uh, a person can have first class training, they can have an ins uh, incisive uh, mind and an endless supply of great ideas, uh, but he or she still won't necessarily be a good leader or a great leader, I should say. And actually the next slide does talk about EQ versus IQ, EQ being emotional intelligence. And D Daniel Gold, uh, Goldman, who is a psychologist and a science writer, published a book in 1995 called Emotional Intelligence. And he's generally viewed as somebody who coined that term first, in which he discusses his research, which discounted IQ as the sole measure of one's ability to lead and succeed. A.B., how do you compare the Harvard listing of skills we looked at a moment ago uh, of essential leaders with Goldman's EQ listing? Well, I, I think the important point is that both are important. Um, I think uh, when it comes to thinking and again, being intentional or purposeful about uh, you know, developing yourself as a leader or others as leaders, you need to take in all this. Uh, uh, the most notable difference, I would say, Marla, is that these, or at least most of them, appear more inward facing, right? Uh, it's, it's like going in front of the mirror and asking yourself, you know, um, you know I, am I self-aware? Uh, do I self-regulate uh, as I should, uh, should be? Do I, you know, am I motivated by the right things? Am, am I empathetic towards people? Uh, do I have the requisite or optimal social skills to engage in the way I need to uh, within an organization or, or externally to, to the extent that you have responsibilities there? I will say a lot of this information, uh, including especially the self-awareness piece of it, uh, sometimes doesn't, uh, you know, uh, even in if you're trying to be honest with yourself, sometimes you're not made aware of how you stand on uh, with these particular uh, in these particular areas until maybe you've done maybe a 360 uh, or you've heard from other of your colleagues or people that have, uh, work with you on whether or not uh, you're, you're calibrated uh, properly or optimally in these particular areas. And, and I, I look, I correlate the two, i.e. the skills as, and the qualities as what you do and how you do it. And I think the how you do it is the EQ piece of it. Um, the next, and I think this is important, not only for leadership, but management. And the next slide talks about leadership versus management. Do you think there's a difference between the two, AB? And if so, what do you see are the big differences? Yeah, I, you know, this is the, the this question gets asked a lot um, uh, because I, I don't, they're not the same in my mind, um, uh, they're very different. Uh, there have been occasions where certainly I've come across a good uh, person who, or a person who is a good process manager. Um, 
but not necessarily, you know, that inspiring or visionary uh, leader. Um, he or she, as a good process manager, uh, sometimes has to uh, rely on others or other factors to motivate people to do um, what is important to that, whatever that process is. Uh, leadership, I think, uh, is, is is something different. I've I've viewed leadership as uh, in being able to influence or inspire someone, uh, someone to do, or some group to do something they might not otherwise do. Uh, the other part of that is uh, the, the team part of it. Uh, how do you measure success? I think good leaders uh, tend to measure success by uh, their team success uh, as opposed to uh, individual successes. I'd be curious, Marla, to, to hear what your thoughts are on the difference, because I I think there are nuances. I think there is overlap. You, you certainly would love to have a leader who's also a good manager, right? And, but you don't always get that. Um, so I, I'd welcome your thoughts on that. And I agree. I, I see leadership and management differently, although there are overlaps. I think very successful managers have learned that to carry out their responsibilities, they have to influence other people, which means they have to make a difference not only in what people are doing, but in how they are doing it to help drive their actual actions. Management, in my view, is tactical, it, it looks at tactics, it looks at resources, roles and responsibilities. When I think about leadership, I bring it up a notch, if you will, and the leadership is more strategic. It's further removed from the owning of the day-to-day -day implementation. I think good leaders set a strategic vision, get people uh, enthusiastic and feel empowered to march towards that mission and then get the hell out of the way to let the managers do what they need to do to actually implement what's necessary in order to reach the goal or to achieve the mission. Um, the next slide goes to what um, AB said and that it's really nice when you have a leader who is a manager, but that doesn't always happen. And in fact, I think one of the issues that we all face is how do we take people on our team who are good leaders, I mean, I'm sorry, good managers, and give them the opportunity to step out of the management role and move more into the leadership role. Your comments, A.B.? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, it's worth highlighting kind of the military side. I, I've seen and I've had the great privilege and honor to serve with some outstanding leaders, uh, many that you would recognize uh, by name. Uh, and, and many of these folks are visionary strategic leaders, um, but admittedly had um, you know, limitations in terms of executing the finer details of the day-to-day. -day. And that's not surprising, right? Um, especially if you're a leader at a, at a very high level. But the important thing here, and this is again where I, I'll emphasize team, Every great, uh, great leader um, also has um, a team around her or him that bridges any gaps and shortfalls so that uh, both from a leadership standpoint, there's certainly no void. And from a management standpoint on the day-to-day, the, -day, the more intricate uh, uh, tactical uh, uh, level uh, areas that there are no gaps as well. So the team works together to, uh, uh, to make sure that uh, they're whole on both fronts. So, so if we go to the next slide, it outlines some of the things about leadership and, the, um, and what makes a leader different than a manager. Yeah, I, I think this captures certainly some of them uh, that you've talked about, Marla, you talked about vision and that's, that's so important. If I were to add anything to that first bullet, I would say not only create a vision, but make that a shared vision uh, across a, a, a larger uh, larger group or across an organization. Great leaders have a way of uh, uh, facilitating the visualization of, uh, of uh, whatever that vision is. Um, we talked about the development of people ar around uh, leaders. Uh, maintain external, uh, external focus. I think that goes to really having 
great leaders have great situational awareness. They know what's going, uh, uh, going on in and around the organization, uh, even beyond their organization. Uh, deliver results, I think that's key. I mean, let's be honest. If you, over time, cannot deliver results, you might not be a leader uh, for a long time, or you're not going to be in that particular leadership role for very long. Uh, the last two are actually, um, you know, kind of important, and I think I raised this a little bit earlier. Um, the best leaders that I've known over my many years and many experiences, uh, when there is failure, team failure, they they take the blame. Uh, but when there's success, they are the first ones to credit the team. Um, it, there is no, uh, you know, uh, like like they say, there's no I in team. And I, the, the leaders I've had the chance to observe, that's a quality that they've, they always routinely um, demonstrated. Yeah, it makes me think about um, the, the plaque that Harry Truman reportedly had on his desk that says, the buck stops here. So as a leader, he took ultimate responsibility for what did or didn't happen. And when I look at this list, Creating a vision, I want to, I want to weave back in the emotional intelligence aspect of it. I think the best way to create a vision as a leader is not to go off in the wilderness and think good thoughts and come back, you know, like Moses with the commandments, like this is the vision, but you rely on your team and do it as a group exercise because when people feel that they have had input into the vision or the goal, it makes it so much easier for them to then buy in and do what needs to be done in order to make that vision a reality. So if we combine the hard skills with the soft skills necessary to develop in order to be a successful leader, the real question as laid out in the next slide are or is, are leaders born or can leadership be taught and learned? Is it something that you can practice? I think that there are people who are born as natural leaders, but that leadership skills can be taught and can be learned. Otherwise, all this leadership development training that people go through is a waste of time and money. And going to the next slide, leadership is inspiring others. A.B., you have a thousand and one great leadership stories. Would you share one or two of them with us and highlight what you think about the story is something that people can borrow or steal and make their own? Uh, sure. I'm always, you know, as a good Navy man, I always have some a uh, pocket full of sea stories, as they say. And for those uh, who have been, uh, maybe attended a military academy on this call, uh, I think you'll understand. So I, I have two stories, uh, quick stories to share. One, I, I graduated, uh, graduated from the Naval Academy in 1980. Uh, in 1981, uh, having left the Naval Academy and gone through some preliminary or, or as they call it, pipeline training, I ended up on board a um, at what they called a, a, well, a warship, Navy warship. They put me in charge. I'm, you, be mindful, I was only 22 years old. Yes, I had had leadership training um, at the Naval Academy, but not really in a, you know, in a real practical sense or environment. So I reported to my first ship, they put me in charge of three divisions. I think I had 78 people reporting up uh, through me um, three divisions, uh, many of the people, at least a handful of people, um, had been in the Navy longer than I had been alive. And so I, I will admit then, notwithstanding the leadership training that I received at the Naval Academy, that at best I was maybe a good manager and uh, my job was to learn. Uh, and that's the point of, uh, that we made earlier is that uh, certainly as uh, generally as, as uh, new lawyers uh, come up, you're not going to have the leadership experiences or training that will that will uh, hopefully come over time. Uh, fast forward to 1995, that just so happened to be the first year or uh, the time or the year that I was selected to, to command. Uh, over my 33 and a half years in command, I, uh, I, or 33 years in the Navy, 
I had the privilege of uh, commanding six, uh, six organizations or six units, uh, five of them which were operational, uh, special uh, Navy special operations uh, uh, units. Um, and, um, you know, I learned a lot, but it was that first, uh, the Navy has tradition, the military has traditions. When you take over a, a new unit, it's called a change of command. Um, we had, you know, I was wearing the formal choker whites, you know, uh, uh, dressed, dressed to the nine, so to speak. Um, everybody, it was a very, uh, you know, there a lot of pomp and circumstance around the uh, ceremony. The unit I was taking, they were formed up looking sharp in their uniforms. Um, you know, the, uh, the band was playing uh, and so forth. We had the American flag, we did all that. It wasn't until there's a moment in time where at least in the Navy, uh, we salute the person that we're taking over from, the, our, my pre our predecessors, and we say, I'm ready to relieve you, sir or ma'am. Um, I did that, and then it was my turn to speak. Um, I looked over the audience, and that's when it hit me. It, it, yes, while I saw the unit members that I would be taking command of, I also saw their families. Um, and I also knew the nature of the, the, the command or the unit was that I might have to send um, uh, my, you know, my unit or unit members into harm's way. It struck me then that my response, I call it the uh, weight of command or weight of responsibility. Even though over the 50, previous 15 years, I had learned how to be a division officer. I had learned to be a department head. I had learned to be an executive officer. And I was a subject matter expert at everything. And I knew I was ready to take, or I thought I was ready to take command. It wasn't until I looked over that crowd that, and saw that, guess what? I had greater responsibility, that the weight of, of command was on my shoulders Marla, you said the buck stops here. That's when it hit me. Um, and it was, it was life-changing because from then on, I, I knew it was not no longer about me. It was about them and oh, by the way, their families, uh, et cetera. So it was a pretty dramatic moment for, for me. And I think so. My takeaway from your stories is that first and foremost, leaders are not afraid to learn they don't have to have all the answers. And sometimes the best thing a leader knows is what they don't know so that they can rely on others to help train them or teach them or own it. And then my second takeaway from your story is that good leaders, and maybe we can go to the next slide, good leaders take into account the entire circumstance so that the decisions that are being made have to fit into a larger rubric or a much larger framework. I don't have any leadership stories quite as um, hair-raising as ABs. I didn't send people into battle. I didn't have their lives in my hands. But in leading legal departments, you have people's careers in your hands. And one of the things you need to do is make sure that they know where they fit in to the larger picture and how to achieve what to achieve. There was a fellow that I uh, used to work for. This is before I was a general counsel. I was head of a legal group for a business unit when I was at Baxter International. And this guy's name is Al, was president of that division. And he never held himself out as the smartest guy in the room, but there was something that he did. And this is actually something I have tried to steal from him because I thought it was so effective. He tried to simplify even the most complicated issues. And as lawyers think about how we love to find the complications in things, he would try to bring things to the lowest common denominator to simplify the true issues and thereby doing prevent, presented a pathway for people to follow, to go forward. Um, so let's start to get a little bit more 
tactical and practical and go to the next slide because we really want to spend the rest of our time with you today talking about how it is that you develop leaders, your successors. How do you take the top talent on your team and help them reach their highest um, their highest potential. Professor Rhodes, as you can see from this, uh, doesn't really think much about lawyers being leaders, certainly as training. And she thinks that to, with rare exception, do lawyers reach the potential as true leaders? Do you agree with this, Amy? And, and if you do, how do we overcome this? Uh, you know, if you don't mind, uh, Marla, I wanted to uh, just take a step back because you raised an important point on uh, on the last uh, slide. Uh, because, and again, a little military side story, I think, or at least in the aftermath of my military career, a lot of people just simply said, well, as a leader, a military leader, you just bark out an order and it gets executed. Well, it's not like that. The, the importance of uh, taking your, or, or to really get to know your your teammates, your colleagues, or your, in my case, uh, you know, military teammates or shipmates, as we say in the Navy, to really get uh, down to understanding, you know, what their strengths and weaknesses are, you know, what motivates them, are there factors external to the workplace that are imp that Im are impacting how they're performing at the workplace. Uh, bottom line is that this whole idea of situational awareness or a situational uh, leadership model applies, and that is. You have to take people individually as they come. They're at different stages of their career. They have different motivators. And so the finest leaders that I've observed are the ones that, um, that adjust their leadership style to fit uh, the, the individual. Uh, and, uh, and if you know anything about situational uh, leadership uh, uh, model, it, it really it kind of takes you through the stages of uh, the individual worker. And, in some cases, the leader will be directing uh, the individual in, other, in another area with another worker. Uh, the leader may find uh, that coaching is more appropriate or, and then if they get more advanced, then really it's about supporting them and, and driving them further. And then finally, if they're really truly advanced and progressing nicely, um, you know, it's, it's all about delegating uh, really the authority to that up and coming um, leader. Now, as far as here, I, I, I will say that, uh, you know, I guess if the answer is, do I agree? I, I would emphatically say, uh, yes, I think it, um, you know, it requires attention. It requires planning and intention, uh, intentionality, um, kind of goal-driven efforts in terms of um, optimizing not only training opportunities, but, um, you know, living through experiences that, uh, from which you can derive um, uh, nuggets of uh, good information on how to, how to develop as a leader. So if we go to the next slide, it's the beginning of what we can do to help our high potential performers learn to be leaders. Next slide is my first suggestion, and that's modeling. That one, in, I learned a lot of my leadership skills and techniques, including situational leadership that AB uh, talked about, which means morphing your style to the situation or to the person. And I learned it by watching others. Now, whether they were intentionally modeling the behavior or that just came naturally to them, but you need to show people what good looks like. You can't just say, go out there and do good things. You need to show what good things make looks like. And one of the ways that I tactically would try to model what good leadership looked like was to talk with my team about what I was doing that I thought was leadership. So why I made a decision, how I made the decision, what I took into account, what I wanted to achieve and how I needed to rely on other people to have it happen. And, and hopefully they would hear and see the good and then take it, adapt it and make it their own. Uh, 
uh, if we go to the next slide, this shows, and AB, maybe you could talk to, but I think one of the important things about this slide is it shows that you can develop people on your team and have them be your successors. Yeah, you know, I, when I first saw these results, not that they surprised me, um, but I found them a little, uh, you know, disheartening um, in that, you know, uh, frankly, the company was, it's basically suggesting that more companies just look outside rather than, um, you know, promoting uh, people from within, which probably, you know, is worth examining, uh, you know, for the, for the 67%, whether or not their succession uh, planning process is where it needs to be, right? Um, I think uh, oftentimes when it comes to succession uh, planning, I mean, I'd much rather see a 50-50 split. I'd be more comfortable with that, right? It, it, you, companies, it, it's certainly in today's world where there's a lot of turnover. Uh, you know, we just, we're still going through a black swan event. Um, you know, shareholders and, and, and board, board members are really calling on le uh, corporate leaderships to really, I think, focus um, more on succession planning, to have a plan in terms of who's going to take on the key roles when somebody rolls, when somebody retires, when they need to find somebody better. And so, you know, it's certainly intuitive that companies would have robust uh, succession planning processes. But oftentimes uh, when, quote, more important things pop up because this is so, uh, succession planning is so time demand, uh, I mean, the, it really demands a lot of effort, a lot of resources. Um, it sometimes falls by the wayside. Um, and so succession plan, if, if companies are honest, will will say that, you know, we still need to do more. Um, a, a good strategic or a good succession uh, planning process at a, at any organization, you know, involves it. First of all, it should be part of st a strategic plan. It it should incorporate or integrate perf the per performance review process, you know, the professional uh, development process for executives, and any sort of mentoring program. You know, all these sorts of things are part of a a, a good succession. Um, uh, plan. And uh, I'm hoping that maybe in a couple of years, we see this, this graph sh shift a little bit so that it's more towards 50-50 maybe. Uh, but that's what it suggests uh, uh, to me. If we go to, you know, to the next slide, um, you know, um, I guess there's some good encouraging news here. I don't want to uh, suggest that it's all bad news. I think the good or encouraging uh, news here is that you know, when GCs and their companies care about and invest in their high performers, their high potential folks, um, you know, and are, are intentional about development and purposeful about it, you know, those efforts bear fruit. And, um, and here, um, uh, you know, there, there are certain, um, it's, it's not shown, oh yeah, it's on the slide here. Uh, such things as shadowing, stretch assignments, leadership training, expanded scope of responsibilities. You know, those things work. Uh, shadowing, allowing, um, you know, your up and comers to, um, uh, to work with, to be mentored by other people other than, you know, the GC themselves within the company is a, is a great thing. Stretch assignments, you know, uh, getting people into, out of their comfort zone to mm -hmm. work in areas that are new to them or or unfamiliar to them, or maybe taking on a leadership role, a, a cross-functional leadership role where it's not just attorneys on the team, uh, but they get to work with other people from other departments or divisions uh, and develop uh, leadership skills uh, that way. And of course, you know, a good example of expanded scope of responsibilities, you know, um, as, a, as a GC or as a corporate secretary, taking on or, or designated someone, making someone um, uh, an assistant secretary. So they got exposure, not only to the board, uh, but also the C-suite and got to, you know, present and do things. Those are types of things that uh, companies, GCs can do to make sure uh, that their succession, but that they're preparing their folks to become more than just lawyers, to become leaders. And I do see how this fits in with what you were talking about on the overall 
succession planning. First and foremost, you need to figure out what is required of the successor because companies change, organizations change, and therefore leadership needs to change. So first is understanding what the strategy of the company is going forward and how it is that the general counsel, either you or your successor is going to fill that role. And then take a look at your talent with, a, you know, the in the cold light of day, not the way you wish they were, but really how they are and identify your top talent. Not everybody's children are equally beautiful. So let's find the top talent and then really identify the gaps between what they are capable of doing now and what they will need to do if they're going to be your successor and put together a plan to fill that gap. And these are specifics that can be done in order to help somebody fill those gaps. The next slide hones in on one of those, and that is coaching. We can't all do everything that our people need. Sometimes we need help from the outside. And you see that a lot of the internally promoted GCs hired an executive coach, sometimes even out of their own pockets, because there is, from my experience, an inherent distrust of human resources. Human resources serves the company and not necessarily the employee. So if they're gonna get an executive coach, a lot of people wanna choose their own and not necessarily have somebody that is on a company's roster and they find the coaching very valuable. And the next, the next um, slide shows that uh, it does make a difference of when you are being promoted from within to in fact, get the executive coach besides modeling the behavior and giving people the opportunity for coaching. There are other things that we can do. Next slide going to increasing C-suite and board exposure. We all need to recognize that we will not be choosing our successors. Other people will be doing that. And so the best thing that we can do if we want to have successors within our organization is to make sure that our top talent has the opportunity to be seen by those who will be choosing our successors and to have them I'm not talking about a beauty pageant where they just get marched through, but actually from a substantive, this is what I've accomplished perspective. It's very important for the C-suite and the board to see the talent within the legal department, not only by what they accomplish, but how they accomplish it. And part of the how is around executive presence. And the best way to demonstrate one's executive presence is how you present to the board of directors or to the C-suite. And these, I think in order to develop our successors, we have to be very, very deliberate about identifying the needs they have and putting together plans to, to fill those gaps, to make sure that they can be ready, willing and able. I think that one reason that companies go outside in with the frequently, frequency that they do to find their successors is because they don't understand the talent they have internally and that the talent hasn't been pressure tested. Do you have any thoughts, A.B., in this regard? Uh, no, I think uh, I, lo I love this list. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think these are, but again, I think the important thing is that that it's, it's, it's putting these, this list into action and, and it's making sure mm -hmm. that it's part of, you know, uh, individual development plans, that it's uh, a part of the thinking. A lot of this stuff needs to get socialized beyond just your team uh, because, uh, you know, the uh, other other colleagues, uh, other members of the C-suite, for instance, uh, you know, uh, their buy-in is important. Their support is uh, important. Um, and that's why you you not only uh, you, you know, look for opportunities to uh, 
make sure you're, you, the people that you're developing are getting that exposure, are getting those responsibilities, but also that um, you're advocating and supporting uh, them in terms of uh, how others um, in the company who are key decision makers view these individuals. I often say that it's, you know, if you want a particular, or you want to ascend to a particular position, or you have aspirations, not only do you have to see yourself in that role, but you got to make sure that the people around you um, see you in that role as well. And that's so that, uh, you know, uh, I've always worked to, to make sure that, uh, for instance, the CFO and the, uh, or the uh, M&A team or the business development team uh, see, um, you know, the folks that I'm trying to develop as more than just lawyers, uh, uh, as critical teammates who are willing and able to take on greater responsibility. So I like this list. One of the questions that's come from the audience is, what type of committee involvement are we talking about here? And generally, when I think of committee involvement, it would be cross, it would be two types of committees. One is cross-functional. So people outside of the legal department see you in action doing something that's not just as a lawyer. Um, and if you, if you can have your team, your, your potential successors lead a cross-functional team, that is great because they don't have the sort of Damocles over people's heads. They can't decide whether they get bonuses or promotions because these are not people who report directly to them. They have to lead through influence, which is sometimes the hardest type of leadership as opposed to command and control. So I think cross-functional is very important or and or transformational. So even if it's within the legal function itself or the compliance group, have your top talent, somebody who you think could be a successor, lead a transformational effort with goals and measurements and metrics and have them live with the transformation after the fact. People that get moved from job to job to job very quickly, that's, that's one indicia of success. But what we do is we rob our people of the need to learn how to clean up their own mistakes if they move too often, too quickly. And so I think that's an example of the types of committee work that I would want my potential successors or for anybody who I want to develop to be on. Do you have other ideas, A.B.? Yeah, um, the ones that come to mind uh, that, um, uh, that I found to be great uh, um, development uh, grounds for uh, you know, the up-and-comers uh, was uh, in the public company realm was the disclosure committee. Uh, also, crisis management uh, is a, a great, yeah, you know, the, whether it's a committee or a task force or, uh, you know, uh, those are great uh, high visibility uh, committee works and uh, very cross-functional. Others that come to mind again are uh, some uh, acquisitive companies have uh, business development, M&A teams, uh, again, cross-functional, uh, great opportunities to, to not only be, be a member of that committee, but to, uh, to exert some influence and leadership uh, and develop some skills, uh, but also get to, to be known by others beyond just the legal, uh, the legal team. So most organizations are, they're either, they're either flat or they're hierarchical, right? There's only one GC slot. If, you have, if you've done hiring well, and if you've developed the talent on your team well, there's more than, hopefully, in the best of all worlds, there's more than one individual who could be your successor but either you're gonna leave soon, you're never gonna leave, or only one person's gonna win that competition. How do you go about, A.B., helping people who really deserve to be leaders and deserve to grow and expand, step out of your organization for those opportunities? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And that's the reality, right? And so when I embark with an individual, uh, you know, a mentee of mine or, or one of my direct reports, or maybe even a, a layer or two down, 
that uh, you know I see high potential and that has a aspirations that you know to become a general counsel. I make it very clear right up and that I can't guarantee that they'll be. I'll help them prepare to be a general counsel. It just may not be here at this this company, our company. It may be elsewhere. And in fact, you know, one of the things I I'm very proud of is that I have five individuals who are current GCs now who. Uh, you know, we did exactly that. We were, we were very purposeful and intentional. Uh, uh, two stayed within, uh, were successors in that company, but three uh, were outside. And so um, the other thing that I've also um, looked for is opportunities for them to, as we say in the Navy, cross deck, to move elsewhere in the company to take, you know, maybe take on a PL uh, responsibility or, um, or to handle if compliance is separate, to move to the compliance area. There are, are, are ways uh, and areas that, you know, I, I think it's, it, it may be imprudent for somebody to say, you know, I wanna be the GC of this company and that's the only thing I want. Um, and, and I think that's too narrow-minded. And, and I think if you broaden out or open up the aperture on, I mean, there are all kinds of opportunities within and beyond the company. I think you hit on some a couple things really important, Davey. First is that this might be more of a manager as opposed to a leader, but we also manage our teams to help people think about what they can do in their careers and open their minds up and help them identify what they really like to do and then give them feedback about what they're really good at and what are the opportunities that that constellation can present to people on your team. So I, I think that's, that's very critical. And like you, AB, when I take a look at what my legacy, my general counsel or my leadership within the legal, uh, within the legal realm legacy is, it's not that I won big cases. It's not that I helped my companies grow through acquisition. It's where the people who reported to me are. And over half of the people who have reported directly to me have gone on to be general counsel of other organizations. And that's how I put a, you know, a, a notch on my belt on. That was something good. That's something that I acquired. And that requires a lot of EQ, which gets to another question we have, which is talking, asking us to talk more about the important soft skills to develop. As a leader, in yourself and in others, AB, what do you think are some of the most critical soft skills that are important for success? Yeah, I think you gotta care about people. You gotta care about your team, you gotta be, um, there are times where, um, you know, sometimes leader has to be tough, but some, oftentimes leaders just need to, uh, to be able to relate to the people they're, um, they're leading, um, or even more generally is a uh, soft skill is developing those great, uh, professional relationships that are developed and nurtured at a personal level. That's been a lesson learned for me. Um, it works better that way. Somebody who, if you reach that kind of level of relationship, they are likely to be always supportive. They will, you know, they, they will rarely, if ever, undermine you. Hopefully, um, and I think uh, another soft skill, if you will, that I really think is important that often gets lost um, in this discussion of leadership is, although it it was showed up on the Harvard thing, is they called it honesty and integrity. I think, you know, one's character is very important, especially if you're a leader. I have, you know, seen some people that I think have thought, you know, I thought they were wonderful, inspire, inspiring, visionary leaders, only to find out that um, their, their character fell short at some point and it got exposed. And um, I just don't think that's the perfect, uh, certainly not the optimal situation. So I do think probably one of the most important leadership traits of, uh, that I've observed is, um, is um, this idea of uh, good character. They, uh, I think it was John Madden, uh, the old ba a former basketball coach, longtime basketball coach at UCLA that said, 
uh, there is no good leadership um, without good character. And I think he's, um, you know, absolutely right. Um, it's all about a leader doing the right thing when her or his back is against the wall and that, you know, a lot's at stake and people are depending on a, on a decision. Uh, some people might be apt or inclined to take the shortcut or to take the easy way out. I'm not, I'm a big believer in that one should not do that. Um, and um, I'm not saying it's easy, uh, but again, uh, uh, you can have an inspirational leader, but if you can't ultimately trust that person, then, um, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not convinced that's the leader that I want to emulate. So um, I think that's important. I mean, and the other part is on the soft skills part is you've all seen it. I mean, you, people who are more self, uh, self-interested, self-absorbed, um, self-centered, uh, as opposed to being team oriented, to be, to take one for the team type of mentality uh, you know, those are the people that I, I kind of watch more closely because I'm not sure what's really motivating them and whether or not they have the, the greater good at heart or in mind when they execute their duties. So before we wrap up and AB, I'm going to ask you to wrap up. There is one thing that I think from a soft skills standpoint that I is critical for leaders and that is around self-awareness, but the self-awareness is not, it has to be an outside in type of thing. What is the effect your actions, your words, your behavior is having on others so that you are, do, if you're doing something, you're doing it deliberately and you're not, you're not causing havoc or reaping uh, results that you're not intending to because you are unaware of how what you do affects others around you. And it's impossible to adapt your leadership to a variety of situations if you're not aware about number one, what the situation requires and number two, how your actions affect those in the situation. And that's such a hard thing to teach other people to do. Storytelling is very important, giving constant feedback, uh, both, both constructive as well as positive is critical to helping people develop. Our time is coming to an end, A.B. Maybe we could wrap up and would you comment on this last slide by Jack Walsh? Yeah, I like this. I mean, that leadership is the art of causing people to believe in your vision and help you achieve it. Uh, yeah, I think we, we've said it maybe in a, a couple different ways, but I think that's accurate. I, let's, you know, quite honestly, you know, sound, strong leadership is absolutely critical to the long-term success of most every organization. Um, and while you know some people may possess those natural leadership abilities that uh, we talked about, Marley, you mentioned earlier, because I do think people there are some people that are, do have uh, you know this uh, innate talent uh, in this regard. Uh, but let's make no mistake: uh, leadership abilities, capabilities. Leadership skills can and should be developed and honed over time through both, um, you know, more formal training um, and and making sure that you're getting exposed to the experiences that will help you develop or help you, uh, among other things, the opportunity to observe uh, leaders, good and bad, on and and uh, learning from those moments. Um, if you want to be uh, a, a better leader, a good leader, and or you want to ensure that others that are following your way or want to be you and aspire to be you, um, getting back to that succession planning and being very purposeful and intentional about that just continues to come to mind for me because you can build so much into that and you, and you really should in the development uh, of individuals. So those are my... Uh, some of my closing thoughts and comments, Marla. Thanks, A.B. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Bob, any final comments on your end? Um, I guess the one thing I'd like to do is, Taylor, if you could just uh, take it to, to the last slide um, as, as we wrap up here. 
Um, I, I want to thank uh, Marla and, and AB for taking the time to share your information today. Um, a lot of great points. I know it's it's uh, it's some great reminders that uh, that you touched on today, which I know I appreciate, um, and, and I think a, a lot of other people uh, will enjoy as well. And um, you know, just as a reminder, you know how we are helping. Uh, individuals as well as organizations. It's it's through um, you know recruiting uh, key individuals for their legal and compliance department. Um, it's it's you know people like uh, Marla and AB providing you know leadership development and executive coaching services. Uh, they do quite a bit of that as well as you know helping organizations um, you know with a succession planning process and, and really um, helping legal and compliance departments, you know, optimize uh, the, the organization, um, improve and develop the organization. Um, so those are kind of the four areas that is, is uh, you know, what Parker Gilmore focuses on. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously you've got contact information here. If, if um, you can reach out to any of us to, uh, to ask any questions. And, um, you know, I just wanna thank everybody for participating. Uh, and uh, we look forward to having you participate in the uh, future uh, GC Advantage webinars. Uh, thanks Bye again. Bye, everybody. Stay thanks safe, now. do great things, and march forward. Have a great day.